Welcome to Module 3 of our State Review Panel Training. My name is Shelley Ramos. I'm the Director of the Curriculum Division at TEA, and it's my pleasure to share some information with you today about the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, the TEKS or the TEX, um, and the role that they play in your review of instructional materials. This module will dive deeper into the review of um, the standards within the instructional materials and basically tell you what it is that you're looking for. So um, we'll spend about two minutes just briefly talking about state review panels and the purpose for convening these panels. And, and then we'll spend probably about you know, eight to 10 minutes making sure that you have a good understanding of the TEKS, um, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. Um, we'll spend a, a little bit more time probably about 10 minutes talking about breakouts because the work that you do as state review panels all centers around the breakouts of the TEKS. We'll also go in to some information for about four minutes on the English language proficiency standards, which you will also be looking for in your review of instructional materials. And then lastly, and, and most importantly, I think, we'll spend about 12 minutes talking about exactly how you conduct the evaluation of each product to which you're assigned. So we'll start first with an overview of the state review panels that are charged with reviewing instructional materials for TECS and ALPS coverage. As you know, state review panels are convened to review the materials uh, for a number of different aspects, but first and foremost, we ask that the state review panels um, it, take a look at all of the materials to determine the TECS and the ALPS that are covered. Those are your primary responsibilities. We do also ask that while you're doing that, um, you identify any factual errors that you might find as you come across it. And we also encourage you to document any comments and observations about the materials that you're reviewing, in particular, um, any observations that you might have regarding the quality of the materials. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, your first and foremost responsibility is to examine text coverage um, and ELPS coverage as well. Um, and really that's the fundamental mission of the state review panels is to ensure that these materials are aligned to the state standards. So the primary focus of this particular module is to ensure that you have a good understanding of the text because you'll be reviewing all of the instructional materials uh, first and foremost with an eye to text coverage. Um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time right now talking about the, the text or TEKS, either pronunciation is correct. So since your primary function as a state review panel is to address the coverage of the TEKS or the TECS um, in each product, I wanna spend a little bit of time doing a deep dive into the standards themselves so you it can ensure that you have a good understanding of them. Um, many of you already do, so um, bear with me for a moment as we dive a little bit deeper into the standards. So the TECS consist of two main parts. They consist of an introduction, and the standards. The standards are um, descriptions of what students should know and be able to do at the end of each course and grade level. They're broken up into two parts and the standards really are the, the meat of the TEKS as opposed to the introduction. But that meat is broken into two parts, knowledge and skill statements and student expectations. And, and you can see a, a very simplistic diagram of that here to the right. Start first with a little bit of an explanation of introductions. Um, mentioned that a lot of folks aren't that familiar with the introductions because they generally provide a description of the content of the course, a philosophy behind the subject area or the course itself, and, and sometimes some key information about a particular course. Here on this slide, you see um, an example of math for first grade where it's really focused in on just giving a nice overview of what the primary focus areas are for first grade math. And so it's really, as the name is, just an introduction to the content that will, uh, that will follow in the standards. Here's another example of an introduction, this time from grade four reading language arts. And again, it, this is more about the philosophy of the standards themselves and the interconnected nature of all the different domains of of language. 
Last example from introductions, this one, this time from personal financial literacy, another good example of how introductions tend to just give some background information and a little bit of philosophy to the course. This one you see in the very first sentence, um, telling teachers that the course is designed to be interactive and research-based and really kind of just talking a little bit more about the philosophy in which the standards themselves are grounded. So moving into the overview of what I would call the, the meat of the standards, um, we'll start first with knowledge and skill statements, or sometimes they're referred to as KS statements. These are broad statements about what students should know and be able to do. They're not very specific and that's um, intentional. They often serve kind of an organizational function within the standards. So they group like sets of standards together. Um, to do that, oftentimes they're organized into strands and sometimes even substrands, as you can see in this diagram here at the right. They always begin with a number, so you can identify them, number one, number two, number three, et cetera, um, and they always end in the phrase, the student is expected to. I mentioned strands and substrands. Um, while most subject areas, if not all of them now, um, each are divided into strands for organizational purposes, not every subject area has substrands. Um, but one good example is some of the strands within reading language arts do have substrands. Um, however, in a subject area like mathematics, for example, we only have strands and no substrands. So here's an example of, um, of a knowledge and skill statement. You can see, of course, it starts with the number one. And then you'll also see um, just sort of the language. It's a rather broad statement about what students should know in the area of oral language. You can see it's got a rather long strand name, Developing and Sustaining Foundational Language Skills. And then, of course, we've this is one example, as I mentioned, for reading language arts, where some strands have substrands, and in this case, oral language is the substrand. So moving on to the next subdivision, if you will, of the TEKS, we have student expectations. You'll often hear us refer to them as SEs. Um, these are the more specific um, explanations of um, the skills that students should have demonstrated proficiency in or um, descriptions of how students will demonstrate the knowledge or the skill. Um, they are specific to the knowledge and skill statement and then to the strand under which they are organized. Um, these statements always begin with a verb, um, an active verb, um, and almost always they begin with a letter. So A, B, etc. You're familiar with um, our numbering system for the TEKS, I'm sure. Um, so knowledge and skill statement one, student expectations C, might be referred to as 1C. Sometimes, however, these are even further subdivided. The student expectations might be divided into what we refer to as Romanets. They go into further detail. And you can always tell a Romanet because it begins, instead of with a letter, it begins with a lowercase Roman numeral. So it might be 1B, lowercase Roman numeral 3, 1B3. Um, and of course, they are always preceded by the phrase, the student is expected to. Here then is an example of a student expectation along with its knowledge and skill statement. This example comes from grade three mathematics. You can see in the knowledge and skill statement um, comes from the strand of algebraic reasoning and it's about uh, analyzing and creating patterns and relationships. So here you can see the student expectation begins with the active verb represent. So that's how students will demonstrate their knowledge. And then it goes on to say one and two step problems involving addition and subtraction of whole numbers up to 1,000. More, a little more detail, using pictorial models, number lines, and equations. So that's a, that's a little bit of a long student expectation, but that's a good example. Here we have an example for you from grade two reading language arts. Again, you can see um, the knowledge and skill statement above. <clears throat> the general topic area of this particular um, strand is phonological awareness. Actually, this is a substrand, beginning reading and writing. And the student expectation is a Romanet. You can see with the um, lowercase Roman numeral one. So 2A1 requires students to produce a series of rhyming words to demonstrate phonological awareness. So 
Um, we have a little bit of a visual for you on this next series of slides um, to help you sort of visualize how the standards fit together, the different subdivisions that we've just talked about. So if you think about this great orange box um, as the standards themselves, the TEKS, they're made up of individual knowledge and skill statements. So um, here, the, the smaller boxes that the arrows are pointing to would then be the subdivisions of the knowledge and skill statements. Those knowledge and skill statements then are subdivided into individual student expectations or SEs. So you can see those here in the small blue boxes. Student expectations then, and this is one that we really haven't talked about, but we will in just a moment, are made up of what we refer to as breakouts. You could see those are illustrated by the even smaller light blue boxes on this graphic. So what are breakouts? The breakouts are really important to know because that's what you'll be focused on in your review of the instructional materials. Um, so we'll dig a little bit deeper into breakouts right now. So breakouts are the component parts of any student expectation. And you all have often um, probably heard, heard a reference to unpacking the standards. When we unpack a standard or a student expectation, we're really looking at the individual component parts of any SE. <clears throat> the reason that they're relevant to the work that you're here to do is because that's how we determine whether or not a material has covered a student expectation. So let's look at this example here. It's a fairly simple student expectation. Students, this is from mathematics, um, students are um, to identify examples and non-examples of halves and fourths. It seems like a very straightforward SE, but then when we start to look at the component parts, you can see that students are expected to identify examples of halves. They're also expected to identify examples of fourths. Further, they're expected to identify non-examples of halves and non-examples of fourths. So this particular student expectation is actually consisting of four separate breakouts. There are some rules when it comes to determining breakouts and we've tried to identify some of the key rules here, which are usually flagged for us by specific terminology that might appear in a student expectation. So the word and would um, mean to us that all parts that are connected by that word and must be addressed. So halves and fourths in the previous example means that both halves and fourths would need to be covered in a material and of course instruction provided in those. The word or, however, means at least one part must be addressed. So if that student expectation we just looked at said halves or fourths, then one or the other, but not necessarily both, would need to be addressed. The word including, very similar to and, these are examples that are expected to be addressed and in fact must be addressed. So anything that would follow an including statement, all component parts of that would need to be its own breakout. Um, however, the word or the phrase such as, those are illustrative examples only and all of them could be covered, none of them could be covered in the work that we're asking you to do, you would not be asked to look at anything that follows a such as state. This example comes from grade two reading language arts and the student expectation asks that students use context within and beyond a sentence to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. So on this slide, you can see <clears throat> a graphic that'll look somewhat like the document that you'll be working out of that includes breakouts. So on the far left column, you'll see the knowledge and skill statement it comes from the developing and sustaining foundational language skill strand, substrand vocabulary. Students use newly acquired vocabulary expressively. <clears throat> the student expectation again has been um, dropped into the middle column and so some of you may have already figured out how this breaks out, but if not, I'll go ahead and identify that for you. So the first breakout, students are expected to use context within a sentence to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. And the second breakout, students are expected to use context beyond a sentence to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. So this particular SE has two breakouts. A second example for you comes from grade one mathematics. And in this student expectation, you'll see that students are expected to skip count by twos, fives, and tens to determine the total number of objects up to 100 
and 20 in a set. So again, you can see where we've laid out the KS statement on the left, student expectation in the next column, and then we will have broken out the student expectation on the right. So hopefully you're trying to break these out in your heads at home as you watch, but you'll see the first breakout is that students are expected to skip count by twos, then by fives, and lastly, by tens. So there's a total of three breakouts for this particular SE. I wanna point out that you'll see the word is and that indicates that each of these must be addressed. So twos, fives, and tens to determine the total number of objects. So this third example of a breakout comes to us from the personal financial literacy course, which some of you may be reviewing. And under the Ensuring and Protecting strand, uh, students are expected to explain the costs and benefits of life insurance, including term insurance and whole life insurance. So for those of you who remember our conversation about terminology from a few moments ago, that word including should um, remind you that anything that follows that, any examples following an including phrase must be addressed. So looking at the breakouts for this particular student expectation that we just looked at, of course, you've got the KS statement over in the left column. You've got the SE in the second column. And if we were in person, I before I show you the breakouts for this, I would quiz you to ask you uh, to guess or, or to make an estimate of the number of breakouts that you think that is. So I'm asking you virtually, so um, everybody take a moment to think about how many um, component parts are in this particular student expectation. So you're all um, expert students now, so we'll jump into these particular breakouts. So you will, um, if you shouted out the answer four or mentally shouted out the answer four, you're correct. So this particular um, student expectation breaks out in four ways. Explain the costs of life insurance, in term, including term insurance explain the benefits, including term insurance, explain the cost of life insurance, including whole life insurance, and explain the benefits of life insurance, including whole life insurance. So um, yay for those of you who answered four. Next example comes to us from Reading Language Arts, grade one, and you'll see in just a moment why we're um, focusing on this particular student expectation. Um, where students are expected to develop social communication, such as introducing him or herself and others, relating experiences to a classmate, and expressing needs and feelings. So in this particular student expectation, you can see here, our, obviously, our knowledge and skill statement, our student expectation, um, and then breakouts. So again, um, quiz yourself at home, how many breakouts does this particular student expectation have? For those of you who remember the terminology slide, you know that such as precedes examples that are, sim that are simply illustrative examples and are not required to be addressed. So hopefully everybody recognizes that this student expectation only breaks out one time. Develop social communication, we don't ask that you look for anything after the such as, because again, they're just possible illustrative examples and they're not required to be addressed. And then lastly, the breakout from grade four math, student expectation compared to fractions with different numerators and different denominators and re represent the comparison using the symbols greater than, equal, or less than. So hopefully that gives away your answer to you. Take a look at this particular breakout. Again, knowledge and skill statement on the left, student expectation in the next column, and breakouts um, in the subsequent column. One thing I wanna briefly mention before we look at the answer to this, if there were Romanettes, um, there would be an additional column to the right because the student expectations um, wouldn't need to be divided, the student expectation itself would need to be divided by each Romanette. So in this particular one, Students are expected to compare two fractions with different numerators, compare two fractions with different denominators. The word and here illustrates that it's something that's required to be addressed and they have to represent the comparison using the symbols greater than, equal, 
or less than. This word or means that we're not going to break out those symbols. Um, any of them could be addressed, but not all of them are required. So we've addressed how you determine coverage of student expectations in the TEKS. Now let's turn our attention for a few moments to the English Language Proficiency Standards, or the ELPS. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the ELPS, the ELPS are a separate set of standards. Um, they're separate from the TEKS, and they outline proficiency level descriptors for English learners. And they're focused on the four domains of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. They are, an, as I said, an independent set of standards. They, um, unlike the TEKS, they don't vary by grade level. It's just a single set of standards for K-12. And they are required to be implemented in each subject of the required curriculum. So for particular subjects and grade levels, there are um, review requirements for the ELPS. So as far as instructional materials coverage of the ELPS, a couple of points that I want to make sure to emphasize for you. Um, so materials are only required to cover the ELPS that have been designated as appropriate for instructional materials. Sometimes that varies by subject, sometimes by grade. As you can imagine, some of those language proficiency standards don't really lend themselves to inclusion in instructional materials. So we've identified only the ones that are required to be addressed. And primarily the focus of the ELPS tends to be on the teacher materials. Wanted to share with you an example um, from the ELPS so that you, if you're not that familiar with them, you can take a moment to familiarize yourself with the standards. There are two parts of the ELPS, um, two primary parts that you'll be looking at. One are the second language acquisition student expectations. Um, they obviously, they identify the language acquisition skills that students in grades K-12 are expected to have in each of the domains of language. Here's a good example. It comes to us from the reading domain, um, a couple of different student expectations. So. Um, Students at K-12, an English learner at K-12 is expected to demonstrate comprehension of increasingly complex English. They do that through a, a number of different things as required by this standard. Shared reading, retelling or summarizing, responding to question taking notes. So those would be the elements that you're looking at in the instructional materials. Another example, they're expected to read silently with increasing ease and comprehension for longer periods. So you can see that some of these might lend themselves better to instructional materials and, and those will be identified um, for coverage in your tool. The second part of the ELPS that we want to make sure you're familiar with are the proficiency level descriptors or the PLDs. Um, these identify the level of proficiency in each domain um, in each, and, and they're divided into four different levels. Um, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. Uh, one thing I do want to point out to you is PLDs do vary by grade level. Uh, there's not a great deal of variation, but there are certain areas of PLDs where kindergarten and first grade standards are different than second through 12th grade standards. This particular example comes from the domain of speaking. This is um, a PLD at the intermediate level. And you can see a, a description of a student who is um, at intermediate in speaking. They are able to express simple original messages, speak using sentences, and participate in short conversations. They may hesitate frequently or for long periods, um, but this is kind of a description of a student's proficiency at this particular level. So moving on then to what you're going to do. Um, we've talked a lot about the ELPS and the TEKS, but how are those important to the work that you're here to do? So we're gonna talk a little bit about evaluation. So in order to um, identify a project as eligible for adoption by the State Board of Education, um, by law, an instructional material must address a minimum of 50% of the TEKS. What that means is 50% of the total number of student expectations for that course or grade level. In addition to that, it must address 100% of the ELPS that have been designated by TEA for coverage for that particular course or grade level. 
It's important for you to remember that all student expectations that fall under a knowledge and skill statement do not need to be addressed in order for 50% of the SEs under that KS statement to count towards coverage. And I'll talk, I'll show you a few examples of what that means. If you're like me, you're a visual learner and it'll be more in just a moment. The other area to emphasize is that within a student expectation, all of the breakouts have to be addressed in order to count that SE towards the 50% coverage. So I promised you a visual example and here it is. So remember again, these large orange squares are knowledge and skill statements. The medium sized blue squares are student expectations and the small blue squares are breakouts. So in this example, there are four knowledge and skill statements there are a total of 14 student expectations. So in order for a product to hit 50% coverage of the student expectations, obviously, that means they have to hit seven SEs. Now remember, in order to count a student expectation towards that 50% coverage, all of the breakouts have to be addressed. So you can see here, this example, one of the breakouts wasn't addressed. So this entire student expectation would not be considered covered, but these other two would. So in this example, the simple question would be, are there at least 50% of the SEs that are addressed? You can look at it and know, yes, there are at least 50% that are addressed. So here we see a second example to illustrate this concept of how you determine text coverage for an instructional material. In this particular example, you see that we have five knowledge and skill statements, the medium sized orange boxes, and they, um, if you were to count these blue boxes, medium sized dark blue boxes, you'll see that there are 16 total student expectations in this imaginary course or grade level. And if you count the little blue boxes, you'll find that there are 50 breakouts. So in order for this instructional material to be deemed uh, to meet the minimum requirements of 50% SE coverage, that means then half of 16 is eight. So eight of these student expectations would need to be completely addressed. And that means that all of the breakouts under a particular student expectation would need to be covered. So the well, last thing I wanna say on this note is while statute says that a minimum of 50% of the student expectations need to be addressed, what you will find is that by and large, much more than 50% um, are often covered and that's fine. So how do you determine whether or not a breakout and therefore a student expectation is covered by an instructional material? Um, here we have some language from our State Board of Education rule that really is the best way of thinking about this. And you'll kind of become experts in this language throughout the course of the meeting. So what you're looking for in the materials are opportunities for teachers to teach that knowledge or skill covered in the breakout opportunities for students to learn it or an opportunity for a student to demonstrate or to practice that knowledge or skill in particular. So again, um, you're looking through the materials um, at the particular components in the breakouts, opportunities for teachers to teach, for students to learn, or for students to demonstrate or practice. If it hits any one of these, then you can address, you can consider that student expectation to, or that breakout from a student expectation to be addressed. A few caveats to how you determine text coverage that you wanna make sure to remember. Um, each student expectation must be clearly evident in order for you to say that it is in fact covered. So going back to the previous slide, um, one or more of those components need to be clearly evident um, in your review. A student expectation would not be considered covered if it only um, was addressed in sidebars or say end of section or end of uh, chapter questions, um, captions for photos or illustrations. And then lastly, we've talked a little bit about this particular piece, but I do wanna make sure to emphasize for you that um, examples that come after the word including must be addressed. Examples that come after the phrase such as are not required to be addressed. So you wouldn't be necessarily looking for those. You may find them, that's great, but they're not required to be addressed. 
So let's uh, shift gears a little bit as I close, and we'll talk a little bit about the review process, and I'm sure you'll hear much more about that um, as, you, as you move through this process. So first of all, we would ask that you familiarize yourself with the introduction for the course or the grade level that you've been assigned to do. As I mentioned at the outset, the introduction is important. Um, while it's not required to be covered in instructional materials, it does help to give you context about the course and the content and also the philosophy of the, of the course when it's, um, when it's included in the introduction. Then we'd ask that you review all of the standards, all of the knowledge and skill statements and SEs for that course. Likewise, um, as time permits, we would probably ask that you um, start to familiarize yourself with the ELPS, especially if you're not familiar with them. Then what you will do is you will begin with the publisher's correlations for the material and you'll make determinations about whether or not you agree or disagree with what they've said is covered. We ask that you judge not the quality of how they covered it, but the presence. So again, was there an opportunity for teachers to teach, for students to learn, or for students to demonstrate or practice the knowledge or the skill, not the quality with which it was addressed? If you do wanna talk about quality, we would ask that you include that in the comments section. So again, told you we'd be repeating this and you'll hear this many, many times. Uh, does the citation included in the publisher's correlation provide an opportunity for the teacher to teach? Does it provide an opportunity for the student to learn? Or does it provide an opportunity for the student to practice or demonstrate the knowledge or the skill? If you said yes to only one of those, then you can accept the citation. As a reminder, it's not an and, it's an or, so only one is needed in order to be uh, able to accept a citation in the publisher's correlation. A few more um, components for you about the review process. Um, if the citation passed that test that we just walked through, it hit one of those elements, opportunity for teachers to teach, students to learn, or students to practice or demonstrate, then you'll record it in your evaluation instrument and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that as you go through these modules. Please remember that these documents um, will become um, open to public examination or to PIR. So any comments that you include, make sure that they're appropriate for a public audience. If you don't approve a citation that's identified in the publisher's correlation, that's fine. Just move on to the next breakout. We do ask that you note a reason for rejecting it um, and why it is that you disagree with their particular citation. Lastly, if you have time after you've reviewed the publisher correlations and all of the breakouts in the evaluation instrument, we, um, we do let you know that you, you can certainly go back and further examine the product to determine if there is somewhere else in the, in the material that you would cite as coverage for a breakout. Um, so let's say you, you don't agree with the publisher's correlation of uh, you know, a breakout for SE 2B. That's fine, and if, you, if time permits, you're certainly welcome to go back and look to see if maybe somewhere else in the materials um, they do address the content for the, that particular breakout. We mentioned at the outset that um, you also um, may identify factual errors. Um, so that's certainly something that might come up as you're reviewing materials. We do ask if that does happen, that you record them in your evaluation instrument. Um, remember that we're really, um, there are two types of errors. Factual errors, which um, obviously would interfere with student learning. Um, they're obviously um, inaccurate and, and uh, are a factual error. But then there's also editorial changes. So this might be more preferential in nature. They don't necessarily interfere with student learning. Um, and the edit or the correction, while you, it, it, um, it would be something that you feel is necessary to be corrected, um, perhaps it's a missing comma, that um, while it might not interfere with student learning, is not correct and needs to be addressed. Lastly, we ask that you record your comments, your feedback, uh, 
in the appropriate place in the review instrument. Um, and you will, as I said, certainly be hearing more about that in another module. So one final note on your review of the products that you're about to engage in, and that's um, a reminder of a particular state law. You, um, some of you are familiar with it and others of you, this may be new to you, um, but Texas Education Code 28.002H um, does establish that the primary purpose of the public, curric uh, public school curriculum is to prepare citizens that are thoughtful and active and engaged um, they understand um, patriotism and can function productively in a free enterprise society um, and appreciate our democratic values. So you might be thinking to yourselves, if you're new to this, um, why is it that we're going over that with you? Um, that is a requirement of all products who, that are approved by the State Board of Education that they comply with this particular statute. So there is a place in your evaluation tool where you will be asked whether or not you believe the product meets this requirement. So um, just wanted to remind you of that um, so that when you get to it, you're aware of the requirement. And then lastly, um, just wanna reemphasize something that we started this module with, which is just making sure that um, you remember that your role is to ensure that the instructional materials directly address the State Board of Education standards, the TEKS. Um, that is really your, your primary function here. So um, if you have any questions about the standards themselves, if there is any confusion, please don't hesitate um, to let us know. Um, one of the ways that you can do that during your review is to send an email to the curriculum division. Um, there are content experts in all of the standards and in the ELPS um, within the division. So we'd encourage you to let us know what questions you may have and certainly um, the team will talk to you about any next steps should you have questions or concerns about content coverage. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoy the review process and I hope you um, have a good time. Thanks.